Hi, everyone. We'll get started on the hour at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. It is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of California Outdoor Recreation Partnership and Outdoor Industry Association. Today's webinar will be 30 by 30 for outdoor industry businesses. My name is Lexi Gertelfeld and I'm with California Outdoor Recreation Partnership. It is ever so fitting that I am joined today by four amazing women um, in the outdoor industry during Women's History Month. Today, we'll have a presentation from Jennifer Norris of the California Natural Resources Agency on what is 30 by 30 and how is California involved. Next, we'll have a presentation from Rebecca Gillis from the Outdoor Industry Association, which will cover federal level of 30 by 30. Then we'll have Alicia Harvey from REI talk about why it's important for companies to be involved in social impact and advocacy. And then we'll have Danica Carey from Sears Innovation talk about how to integrate cause marketing into your business marketing. Following that, I'll talk about why we care at California Outdoor Recreation Partnership, and we'll launch our 30 by 30 campaign for social media. We'll follow up all of that with question and answer um, led by our board chairman, Matt Lyon. Um, he's also the CEO of HydroPack. And um, you can submit question and answer throughout our entire presentation, um, and we'll follow that up at the end. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Jennifer Norris. Jennifer serves as Deputy Secretary for Biodiversity and Habitat at the California Natural Resources Agency. She leads the state's 30 by 30 initiative and oversees cutting green tape in support of landscape scale habitat restoration. Jennifer has led numerous positions in federal and state government, including most recently as supervisor of the Sacramento Office for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. She has extensive experience in conservation policy, endangered species protection, and ecosystem management. She holds a Bachelor's of Science in Resource Policy and Planning from Cornell University a master's of science in conservation biology from the University of Michigan and a PhD in ecology from the University of New Mexico. When she is not at work, she can be found exploring wild beaches, forests, and deserts with her family. Jennifer, I'll turn it over to you. 
Thank you so much, Lexi, and thank you, everyone. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you today about California's commitment to conserve 30% of our lands and coastal waters by 2030. So um, what I will do is, is share with you a little bit about our initiative. But first, I just want to set the table for you um, as you think about your uh, participation in this effort and really imagine yourselves as part of a global movement. 30 by 30 has been committed to by over 70 countries around the world, including the United States. California is one of uh, many subnationals that has made this commitment, um, and we're really proud to be here. So 30 by 30, hashtag 30 by 30 CA, that's what we use. That's our commitment to conserve 30% of our lands and coastal waters. And I'm going to walk you through what that entails. Next slide. So our commitment to 30 by 30 has three key principles. The main one is really to protect biodiversity. The 30 by 30 movement recognizes that we need to protect nature in its natural state as much as possible to protect the biodiversity that sustain the ecosystems that sustain us. That's a bit of a mouthful, but fundamentally we live on a complex ecological, in a, in a complex ecological system and having all those plants and animals that make that system work are key to our survival. Um, so fundamentally, 30 by 30 is about protecting biodiversity. But we know, and you know, that when you protect lands in their natural state, you can also responsibly allow access to nature. And so we want to use our conservation movement to expand that access, particularly for those that have not had access previously. And finally, we want to use our land conservation efforts to mitigate the effects of climate change by sequestering carbon and other greenhouse gases, as well as building resilience to climate change by buffering us from the effects of climate change, whether it's through um, coastal wetlands or uh, providing uh, green spaces around cities to clean our air. Uh, resilience to climate change is really important for us as we move forward. Most of you probably saw the new IPCC report um, we're on a bad path and conservation is one of the keys out of it. Next slide, please. Our conservation framework also includes uh, several core commitments that really undergird everything that we do. We wanna work to achieve justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. The state of California has made a strong commitment to our tribal partnerships and we wanna strengthen those as we implement this strategy. And then fundamentally, we want to demonstrate to the world that you can have economic prosperity, you can advance clean energy, and you can have be the breadbasket of the world while you uh, conserve the world at the same time. So California has been long been a leader in this, and we're really excited to be advancing these core commitments while we conserve 30% of what we have. Next slide, please. So key to being able to count to 30 is uh, actually having a definition so you know what you're counting. This has been one of the most fraught parts of our uh, effort and it continues to be a, a robust debate. But we put a marker down and said that uh, for something to be a 30 by 30 conservation area, it needs to be a land or coastal water area that is durably protected and managed to support functional ecosystems both intact and restored, and the species that rely on them. This really recognizes that we need to protect spaces in their natural state as much as possible and restore those places that have been degraded back to a healthy state. Next slide. So what this means for California across uh, lands is uh, a broad range of landscapes actually, of landscape types actually meet this definition. This includes uh, dedicated conservation areas, um, recreation lands and open spaces, those that you probably your members enjoy, as well as working lands. A lot of California has um, protected spaces that uh, employ grazing for management. We recognize the importance of all conservation across California, even those actions that don't meet this definition, um, but we're really focused on advancing uh, more of the first type. And right now, based on that definition, about 24% of California meets uh, that conservation status, which means we have about six or seven million acres to go in eight years. Next slide, please. In 
Coastal waters, uh, marine protected areas meet our definition, which is about 16% of our coastal water area, which means we have about 500,000 uh, acres to go along the coast. I will note that there is a decadal review in process of our marine protected areas, and we're looking now at how effective they've been. Um, so it's been about 10 years since we established them, and we're reviewing their success. We're also looking at opportunities to enhance conservation in, in national marine sanctuaries because the federal government, of course, has committed to the 30 by 30 goal. And there are a lot of national marine sanctuaries along the coast that we think with improved conservation can help us achieve our target. Next slide. So our strategy has a suite of pathways to 30 by 30. Those include acquiring more lands, putting conservation easements on private lands, working with our federal partners in, on lands and coastal waters to enhance conservation, um, really working with our regional partners to uh, ensure that regionally led conservation is effectively deployed, working on advance mitigation, restoration, working with partners like you, aligning our investments, and then over the long term, uh, stewarding those lands, evaluating whether they're working successfully, and then adaptively managing when appropriate. Next slide, please. The state of California, oh, sorry. We also have a, um, a pretty groovy, and I hope you will check out a website based, uh, website that is dedicated to tracking our progress towards 30%, as well as um, sharing lots of insights about where we have biodiversity in the state, what future climate projections uh, will be, and how they will play out across the landscape. Uh, so I should have put the website on this slide. It's California Nature ca.gov very interesting easy to remember i'll put it in the chat um, go to this website and check it out it's got a lot of interactive maps that are going to allow us to identify places where we have the opportunity to advance conservation uh, link up different landscapes um, and really make sure we're driving on those key priorities next slide we really uh see this, our vision for implementing this, these pathways to 30 by 30 really relies on partners all over the state. We talk about 30 by 30 in California as an open source movement, which means if you're committed to the principles, you're part of it. It's not a centrally led uh, effort. We really think that regional stakeholders and working groups, our tribal partners are gonna be out there helping us make this happen. We have two existing bodies that are supporting us, the California Biodiversity Council. It's been around for decades. It's a state and federal uh, interagency working group. So we've got the feds and the state committed to 30 by 30. So we're working together, looking for opportunities, as well as the California Biodiversity Network, which is uh, growing in number. It's academics and practitioners that are coming together to really wrestle with the science and application uh, questions and challenges for actually making sure that these lands and coastal waters deliver. And then fundamentally within the California Natural Resources Agency, we have uh, dozens of departments and conservancies that are gonna help us get this done. Next slide. We've also put some money on the table. We have some initial investments that are quite significant. Uh, $758 million set aside for our so-called nature-based solutions, which includes 30 by 30, $500 million for coastal resilience projects, $645 million for habitat restoration, another $105 million for wildlife corridors. This is a really good down payment on getting 30 by 30 jump started, and we hope there'll be more after this. Next slide. I just want to leave you with my favorite quote from a Rebecca Solnit uh, in her book, Hope in the Dark. It says, hope is not like a lottery ticket. You can sit on the sofa and clutch, feeling lucky. Hope is an ax you break down doors with in an emergency. I think we're in an emergency. The IPCC report really made that clear, but it's been true for a while. So 30 by 30 is our opportunity to get out our ax and break down that door and make progress. We're really talking about accelerating conservation making it happen faster before it's too late. So next slide. I look forward to working with you. Let's, let's get going. Thanks. Awesome, thanks Jennifer. Thanks for joining us today. Next up, I would like to welcome Rebecca Gillis. 
Rebecca is the state and local government affairs manager at the Outdoor Industry Association, where she is focused on strengthening grassroots support to pursue ideal policy outcomes for a thriving outdoor industry, thriving people and a thriving planet. Prior to her role at OIA, Rebecca held positions at the city of Denver and the state of Colorado. Rebecca is from Golden, Colorado and loves trail running, backpacking and live music. Rebecca, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Lexi, for that introduction, and thank you to Corp for having me today. Um, OIA is grateful to co-host this informative and extremely important webinar. Thank you to Jennifer for kind of queuing up my presentation and making these awesome comments to, to kick us off. As Lexi mentioned, my name is Rebecca Gillis. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I am based in Boulder, Colorado. Before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Cheyenne, Ute, and Arapaho First Nations on which I am presenting from today. I would like to thank and honor them. Next slide, please. You know, Jennifer did an excellent job giving you all an understanding of how California's 30 by 30 initiative will be moving forward. I'm here to expand the aperture a little bit, um, a, bit wider and talk about the federal level of 30 by 30, or what we call kind of conserving and restoring America the beautiful. At the top of this image, you will see the UN Convention on Biodiversity noted, as well as the Paris Climate Accord. Research has been done in these supranational bodies and through works like the Global Deal for Nature and the IPCC report that Jennifer just noted, setting standards to avoid an extinction and climate crisis. Um, emergency. So these sort of studies and scientific research are the origins of the 30% benchmark, which we have been discussing. You can think of the 30 by 30 plans as a stepping stone to an imperative 50% by 2050 effort laid out in the research coming from these global bodies. The Biden administration utilized those guidelines set at the global level to guide his executive order 14,008 in 2021. We'll talk more about that in a minute. From the executive order came the working plan called Conserving and Restoring America the Beautiful. Again, we'll talk more. And finally, you'll see actions at the state and local level to support those initiatives and goals set up at the federal and supranational levels. Please do note that this image is not meant to be hierarchical or linear. All of these efforts have been occurring concurrently over the past years. This image is just a better way to paint a picture of the systemic for, uh, forces at play here. Great, thanks Lexi. Next slide. Okay, Executive Order 14,008. It came shortly after President Biden's inauguration in 2021. And do you remember that California's executive order on 30 by 30 occurred prior to this federal executive order? The executive order calls for the creation of a national climate task force which will oversee a government-wide approach to combat the climate crisis. The Climate Task Force is chaired by the National Climate Advisor and includes cabinet-level leaders from 21 agencies and the White House to enact this all-of-government approach. Next slide, please. So uh, Biden's executive order, this executive order 14,008 is extremely detailed and sets expectations across various lenses, including national security and the economy to fight the climate crisis. For us, important sections of the executive order are highlighted here. Section 214 outlines that the in initiative will be used as an economic, economic driver Section 215 specifically calls out the creation of a civilian climate core to create good jobs and to pursue the imperatives necessary to meet that 30 by 30 mandate. Note that the language also calls out improving access to recreation as a mandate for the civilian climate core. And I'm sure you have all heard a lot of uh, talk about the civilian climate core in the Build Back Better Act, and we can talk about that later if it's of interest. Finally, section 216 outlines the 30 by 30 goal, which we're talking about today. This is where the Conserving and Restoring America the Beautiful report comes into play. Next slide. This report uh, is, is again the section, uh, the product of section 216 just highlighted in the executive order. 
The report calls out three problems threatening our lands and waters that must be addressed to meet the goals of the America the Beautiful initiative. Number one, the disappearance of nature. Number two, climate change. And number three, inequitable access to the outdoors. The agencies listed on this slide are main sort of sponsors of the plan and are agencies where all the action is going to happen. A lot of the action as we're concerned as a group. They all have bureaus or divisions with specific mandates set out in the plan. Next slide. Much like the California plan, the federal plan is based on a set of key principles which are foundational in the view of the administration to reach the goals laid out in the report. Key phrases of these principles are highlighted on this slide. From our perspective at OIA, the most important things to note include the collaborative and inclusive approach to conservation, locally led and locally designed approaches, working alongside tribal nations, and flexibility and adaptive approaches to conservation moving forward. These are the guidelines from which state-based policymakers and decision makers can start formulating their on-the-ground strategies for a robust, localized approach to the 30 by 30 plan. Next slide. So we're actually more than a year out of uh, President Biden's executive order sort of establishing the America the Beautiful initiative. The Department of Interior, Ag, and Commerce released a one-year report providing updates on the national efforts toward conserving and restoring America the Beautiful. I believe that report dropped in late 2021. It highlights the Great American Outdoors Act as well as the passing of the bipartisan infrastructure law as major steps forward on the 30 by 30 effort. New public land designations are also called out, as well as sort of the agencies and administration partners have been holding uh, listening sessions and other convenings to engage various stakeholders in the process. The next most important step here in the federal level of 30 by 30 or America the Beautiful are these upcoming appropriations processes at the federal level. This is the federal government's budget, and it will be pivotal for programs like the Infrastructure Bill as, where, as well as the Great American Outdoors Act to be implemented fully. Our job as, as advocates here in this room is to make sure that agencies at the federal level have full funding to actually carry out the work laid out for them. This is an important advocacy opportunity for the industry over the coming weeks as we approach that omnibus negotiation and um, setting that bill language up. Next slide. So what's our stance? We at OIA are extremely happy the, that both the administration and California is thinking about accessibility and environmental justice for 30 by 30. We believe efforts toward the 30 by 30 goal at the state and federal level will compound. And we take one step further by asserting that conservation outdoor recreation and economic vitality can not only coexist, but can build a momentum that is imperative to meet our carbon mitigation, biodiversity and conservation goals. We know that it's extremely important that these efforts be locally led due to the fact that culturally sensitive programming and processes are pivotal to success on the ground. And we at OIA also believe that both front country and back country conservation efforts should be pri prioritized in the implementation of any 30 by 30 goal. Next slide. So I'm going to keep this short but brief, uh, short and brief, excuse me. Both Danica and Alicia will be talking to the same point. But I just want to say, you know, when it comes to outdoor industry engagement, Simply put, we as the outdoor industry have major stakes in this, this initiative. Healthy lands and waters are truly indispensable for the survival of our industry. We as an industry can start thinking about our definition of flexible and adaptive conservation that allows for sustainability and increased access for all of our neighbors. The time now is really exciting. It's a time for innovation in how we define the goals of 30 by 30, how we make sure that accessibility and sustainability are wrapped up in federal and state plans, and in making sure that both capital and human resources 
are allocated properly at the federal and state level to support those federal and state and local efforts toward the goal. Next slide. Our brands have shared with us some of their plans for supporting America the Beautiful. The most important step for this work, I believe, is at the top of this slide. Everybody take a deep breath. There's a lot happening already across the United States in your local communities and in California that uh, is sort of working toward the 30 by 30 goal. Stop, get a lay of the land, understand who's doing that local work and how you can amplify and support the work already happening. Um, and then start asking yourself questions about how we can all leverage and invest our resources mindfully toward 30 by 30 and expanding outdoor accessibility. And for outdoor companies and brands specifically, how can you all catalyze action from your customers? Can you team up with others in this room, including OIA, to ensure that your customers who do hear about your message have somewhere to go to take immediate actions and to go to to learn more? Finally, I will put it out there to watch for engagement and advocacy opportunities with OIA and our partners. We'll be focusing on 30 by 30 throughout the coming years because as Jennifer noted, this is imperative, pivotal work for all of us. Um, the Biden administration has asked for our input and insight, so we plan to continue to be a force working together to make our voices known and our support for the initiative heard. With that, I'll close. Thanks for your time, and I'll look forward to addressing any questions later in the hour. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. We really appreciate your time. Next, I'd like to introduce Alicia Harvey. Alicia Harvey is the Community and Government Affairs Program Manager at REI Co-op, where she manages its state level outdoor policy work and bolsters the co-op strategy to engage REI employees, members, and the broader community in the fight for life outdoors. She comes to REI Co-op after 11 years at Farm Aid, a national nonprofit dedicated to advancing family farm agriculture and sustainable food systems, where she led the organization's advocacy strategy and grassroots engagement. She has a master's in science in environmental and agricultural science and policy from Tufts University. As a recent transplant to the Seattle region, she enjoys hiking and kayaking in the beautiful lands and waters nearby. Alicia, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Lexi. Uh, I'm grateful to be here and so terribly sorry to be having technical difficulties with my camera. Um, I'm Alicia Harvey and I work with the Community Advocacy and Impact Team here at REI. I use she, her pronouns and I'm joining you from the coastal Salish and Duwamish land in what is now called Seattle. Um, I'm really excited to speak with all of you about why impact work is so critical to who we are and what we do at REI, and more specifically, to really provide an example of a program we've launched that hits at Rebecca's last point, how we engage our customers on issues like 30 by 30. Um, next slide. So REI Co-op has always been a purpose-driven business. We started in 1938 as a member-driven outdoor gear buying co-op, somewhat famously after a disappointing purchase of an ice ax, vexed our founders and led them looking for something better. Um, everything we've done since then, we've approached as a co-op, as a community of outdoor enthusiasts. And historically, there have been sort of two authentic starting points for our approach to social impact that really stems from that founding moment. The first is profit sharing with our employees and our members. Um, and the second is about putting our shared love of the outdoors to work through stewardship. We've been working on conservation in some capacity since our beginning. Uh, but I'd say today, um, our leadership is approaching our purpose in a more urgent and a more intersectional way. This quote from our CEO, I think is one of many indications of how we're more stridently leaning into what we can do authentically as REI Co-op um, and making a difference in our world. And the next slide, um, gives you just a little peek behind the curtains. Uh, business goals and impact are pretty closely intertwined here at REI, and we've really seen our leadership lean into our values over the last several years and become more clearer and more outward in articulating that the health of the planet um, is pretty integral to our bottom line. We have aspirations to grow to a 50 million member community 
but not just a 50 million member community, one that not only represents the diversity of the communities where we operate, but is engaged in amplifying our collective impact. Um, we've really evolved our mission to not only being uh, the goal of connecting every person to the power of the outdoors, but to engaging them in the fight to protect it. And this has um, had pretty dramatic implications for the work we do. Next slide, please. It really means, um, oh, sorry, uh, do the next slide real quick. It really means going beyond table stakes. At this point, so much around sustainability as a business um, is kind of step one in acting as a responsible business in our society and on our planet. Um, the two big challenges are in front of us that we have to address, not only for the welfare of our members and our employees, um, for society and for our business, um, they, they forced us to dig deeper. The first is climate change, which represents the biggest threat to life outdoors. Um, and, and the second is really the, the social inequities and the racial injustice that we as a society have been grappling with on a broader scale. It, it shows up in the outdoor industry as well. And um, this is just a little snapshot of our 2020 impact report we're about to launch our 2020 report. So some of what you'll see here might give you a, a sense of um, some of what we get to share this year. But we look at sustainability and impact in a multi-dimensional lens um, and from an authentic starting point. Not only how can we lessen our climate impact of our business, uh, how can we better invest in a different outdoor culture, a more inclusive and just culture um, from our role as a retailer, as a uh, brand in our own right, where we look at our products in a more culturally and environmentally holistic realm. Uh, but we've also started to consider what does it mean to be a member co-op when we are approaching our impact work? Um, Lexi, uh, let's do the slide just before this one. Great. So, um, we understand that we can play a unique and important role as a membership co-op and uh you know on the left are really for my team um some of our, our programs that are longer standing um where you know we've played historically an important role as serving a, as a convener of a wide range of external and internal stakeholders on meaningful discussions about um, the opportunities and challenges that face the outdoors. So part of our work under government affairs and advocacy has been um, bringing together these coalitions of organizations um, to establish a political voice for the outdoor recreation sector and it's borne fruit. So much of what um, Rebecca brought forward is an indication of that. We have um, almost two dozen states with offices of outdoor recreation. We have 30 states engaged in a learning network on outdoor recreation through the National Governors Association. Um, and then there's so much we do um, and where we see our role is socializing ideas with legislators on both sides of the aisle with whom we build great relationships with to pass major outdoor recreation policies. When it comes to an initiative like 30 by 30, um, we can work with those existing relationships in bringing a bipartisan approach to um, a challenge like 30 by 30. We also um, have brought our profit sharing ethos, uh, sorry, go back, same slide, um, profit sharing ethos to our community investment work. So funding and supporting partners and organizations who drive forward and shape initiatives like 30 by 30 um, is, is a kind of historical role we've played. I would say as we've thought about our membership co-op identity, um, that has brought a new lens to our programming. And on the right is really what has been an extension of that, the REI Cooperative Action Fund and the Cooperative Action Network, which is what I will talk about, um, is really where we're adding this grassroots dimension to the strategies of grant making and advocacy that we've historically done um, and, and creating engagement channels for our employees, our members and our customers to actually join us in the fight for life outside. Next slide. So, um, and we can do the next slide actually just because of formatting here. The Cooperative Action Network is really key to fulfilling that mission of not only connecting our communities to the power of the outdoors, but to engaging them in the fight to protect it. Um, and it's really key to, to scaling. 
our impact. Uh, this is a platform where we engage our community in timely opportunities to raise their voices in support of critical policies, including 30 by 30, um, and to inspire and deepen their civic engagement journey. Where do we focus our energies? What are the sweet spots from which you know, we can authentically make a difference? The network focuses our efforts on three distinct pillars. These may sound familiar um, as they've been already, you know, reverberated in what both Rebecca and Jennifer said. Outdoor equity is critical. Um, every person has the right to enjoy the power of the outdoors and there's so much we can do in the policy realm to make good on that um, basic human right. Climate action, where we tackle that greatest threat to life outdoors, um, the climate crisis at, by especially harnessing natural climate solutions. Um, and and that uh, push for other policies that really um, shrink our carbon footprint and ensure the health of the planet. And then places we love, um, that sort of legacy work of REI in conservation, working to protect the lands and waters and the places where we love to play. 30 by 30, of course, sits pretty squarely within and across these pillars as we've seen the administration and um, other players like state of California take a really intersectional approach to the work. This um, is the homepage for the network and the goal is to make it easy and fast for anyone to contact their elected officials on opportunities to make a difference. We'll be expanding the offerings on this site and providing more storytelling and context to our activations and really um, doing a bit of what Rebecca noted about educating and engaging our community in um, these core issues that are important to us. The next slide is just a little um, snapshot of the America the Beautiful campaign we did last year, um, where we actually focused our energies on asking our community to contact Congress to pass key legislative bills that actually would advance the 30 by 30 goal. Um, if a user were to click on, on one of the cards that is on our homepage, they would be directed to a campaign page like this, where they can see a call to action on the left that um, provides context for the opportunity to make change, the bill or the initiative we're championing. And then on the right um, is an easy form for them to fill out with their information that's necessary to deliver their message to Congress. And where they also, as they scroll down, which is further on the right, can customize the message that is sent to their elected officials. Um, why do we do this? On that next slide, please. How does a program like the Cooperative Action Network advance our impact work as um, REI Co-op? It's really about creating a symbi uh, symbiosis between a bread and butter government affairs shop or grass tops advocacy and grassroots advocacy. I think a lot of, of businesses who may be on this call are, um, you know, used to the work of, of dealing in power and relationships and influence to support public policy, to really um, engage the organization's leadership and government affairs staff in shaping bills in um, trying to position the organization in the political sphere and its, its policy priorities. Uh, a program in grassroots advocacy like the Cooperative Action Network it's where we can bring power in numbers, where we can actually amplify the importance of those issues. It really facilitates what we do in the grass tops realm, um, helping to grease the wheels. And I also, you know, in a two in a sort of two way communication channel between our employees and our members, understand what prior issues are and priorities are important to them. And for companies that don't have a membership base like REI, I would just share that your employees count here. Um, on the next slide, I just want to, you know, underscore that it only takes 30 messages to a congressional office to really get an issue on the radar um, in that office in a bigger way. So, you know, in a state like California, where REI has 3.8 million members, we have 30 stores, we have uh, over 2,500 employees, engaging that community on an issue like 30 by 30 can make a huge impact. Um, and we've got, I'll just end with a great example of really how we've combined the grass tops government affairs programming with this new grassroots program. Uh, on the next slide, a great example of a bill that fits well within the 30 by 30 umbrella um, is what we actually started and launched this program with the replant act, which is a reforestation bill designed to help our landscapes heal from wildfires 
and to address an ongoing backlog and of maintenance on our national forests. Uh, this bill quadruples funding for and triples reforestation rates in our national forests. It's bipartisan. Um, and it's a bipartisan piece of climate legislation that focuses on natural climate solutions. So uh, as people who love the outdoors, this is a really authentic place from which our members and employees could advocate. And uh, we worked closely with American Forest who helped write this bill. Uh, and we're really the only major brand leading an advocacy effort for this on the Hill. Uh, we worked hard to make sure this was bipartisan by showing our support as a brand to both Republican and Democratic uh, leaders. And we heard um, pretty immediately from some of those co-sponsors uh, and, and especially Representative Jimmy Panetta from, from California that um, it made a splash immediately to have our, grass, our grassroots engage on this. Um, they were hearing from representatives and uh, congressional offices who had never before shown an interest on in reforestation, but were approaching their offices about how they could support the bill because there was a, a substantial volume of REI members and employees who were speaking up about this bill. Um, and it really became a must pass in the bipartisan infrastructure um, bill because uh, of that volume working in tandem with what American Forests and we were doing on the Hill. We had 12,000 activists engaged. We peppered the Hill with 34,000 messages on this. Um, and there were so many worthy bills and initiatives that um, we were all working to get to be considered essential infrastructure in that package. But I think uh, we feel good that we played a role in getting this across the aisle in 1.2 billion trees are gonna be planted across the country because of it. So I'll just end there um, and, and pass it over um, to you, Lexi. But uh, the last slide is just this little demonstration of, of what we've done so far. Um, in our first eight months, we sent over 100,000 messages to Congress. We helped pass two bills. Um, and so I just wanna encourage all the businesses on this call to really lean into where you can authentically lead. I think that's one of the major lessons for us in launching this program. Thanks. Awesome, thank you, Alicia. Next up, we have Danica Carey. Danica Carey is the Director of Marketing Operations at Cirrus Innovation, Innovative Accessories, a family-run company based in San Diego, California. Her lifetime in the outdoors has been mirrored by a long-standing passion for team sports, which took her to the University of Nebraska for her collegiate soccer career. Having always been a sports and outdoor enthusiast, she continues to pursue that passion through soccer, ranching, skiing, and just about everything in between. Danica, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Lexi. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Danica Carey. Like Lexi said, I'm the Director of Marketing Operations for Cirrus. Um, we are based out of San Diego, which is the homeland of the Kumaye people. And my pronouns are she, her. Um, and I am really glad that I have the expert handoff as a part of <laughs> my conversation going forward. Um, so some of you out there may be thinking, okay, I'm a brand or I'm a smaller organization, and how do I really step into this conversation and participate in a meaningful way and, and in a way that I can um, manage with the existing things on my plate. So um, what I wanted to talk to everyone about is just about how to integrate this level of cause, cause marketing into your programming. And what we did recently in the last past couple of years is we worked with an organization called Purposeful um, so that we could really make sure that we were being reflective with our internal team as we were externally. Um, I think it's really important that Alicia spoke to is about really leveraging what you have like what your skills and strengths are and as a smaller company as a product company you know we've got so much to focus on already just in the survival of our business and thriving um, in the space that we're in that it's really important to leverage leverage your resources so if you have budget to lend that's fantastic if you don't have budget your bandwidth also counts for something your time and effort should mean something to each other and where we can amplify and support something that you believe in and making a difference um, just by leveraging the relationships that you have, where you can participate um, and where you can lend financial resources as well. Um, next slide, please. 
So what, what we did to make sure that we were being reflective internally is we actually engaged with our entire internal team to make sure that what we were externally projecting, projecting aligned with everyone within our company. And we found not only that we were able to come up with um, this purpose statement that we had our entire company feel vested in, um, but we also were able to engage deeper with each of our individuals on our team so that all of us feel in alignment and in and informed on where the opportunities lie individually, how to participate within our organization, and how to participate outside our organization or outside our organization with events like this or with, or with some of the other members that you've heard speak already um, and some that you'll hear from later. Next slide, please. Um, so engaging everyone on our team, I think, creates a stronger holistic approach to this work and what we're all trying to accomplish together. And I think that's really the key is that we are all working to accomplish something together. So when you're working on cause marketing, you're working on something that is larger than you, larger than your organization. And no one person should, can do it alone and no one person should expect to. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, externally, one of the easiest places to have this conversation is, of course, in social. And when you're engaging on social or integrating into your um, email marketing or, or any external uh, pieces, you really want to make sure you have that equity exchange in place. So understand what you're asking and sharing and make sure you have the appropriate relationships and exchanges to support those asks and shares. I know that there's a lot of opportunity to um, elevate work that maybe you don't have a direct link with and just got to be careful that when you pick forgiveness over permission, you never know <laughs> that forgiveness is not a guarantee. Um, and you may never recognize how much damage that's done to your reputation and to the people that you are, are hoping to engage with. So it's really important to make sure that equity exchange is in place. Um, and remember that at the end of the day, we are also the market and, and the market is where you have a lot of power to direct attention, to direct interest and to help not only your organization and your community, um, but the but the representatives in your area to know what is important to you and anyone within your reach. Um, next slide, please. So as you're infusing this through social, you also want to infuse it to, through every area that you communicate. So whether you make it a part of your email marketing um, to blend in with what you're sharing about your product, but also infuse all of your messaging throughout all of your communications so that there's really a lot of symmetry going along with what you're, what you're planning, what you're hoping to be a part of. Um, along with that, it's very important to have that expert handoff and sharing the stage. You want to elevate others. You only know what you know, so don't try to know, do, or be at all. Um, you really want to develop a network to support this work because, like I said, it, it's bigger than all of us, and it'll take eh, more than any one person or organization can give. Next slide, please. Um, from our lens, you know, we've really taken a stand to try to make that relationship with learning and, and being a beginner be a big part of our communication so that we can help bridge the gap between feeling like there's a, a, a big barrier to access around having to be an expert when you first walk in. And I think that that can be an important thing to remember, no matter what you're doing, if you're talking about advocacy or learning a new sport, it's really important to remember that you want other people in the conversation. And so you want to create an inviting space where you can invite people in to be a part of that conversation because like people have already mentioned before, it's going to take a lot of us to try to actually make these big shifts and big, big changes. So we have to continue to practice what that looks like, inviting people in uh, and, in, and being open to learning what that means for you when you bring someone new into your space that you may not have interacted with before. Um, next slide, please. So at the end of the day, what we are talking about is politics. You know, we're talking about advocacy and, and there's a lot of challenge right now for brands and organizations when you feel like 
you're getting involved on a political stage. Um, that is how you make moves in political in, in advocacy though. And I think what our industry has done a really good job of working towards is making sure that we are speaking from a bipartisan lens. So while you are operating in, in some political messaging, it doesn't necessarily have to have to lean in one direction or the other. You, if you keep the focus on what needle you're actually trying to move and helping bring people together, um, I think you can you can be very successful at integrating some of some conversations in that might feel political leaning to people as long as you yeah, as long as you're clear on your stance you know who you're working with and you know what you're working towards um a big part of that is participating in collective efforts that way you can pull your resources you can extend your platforms it's a very fine line at this stage when it comes to competition versus collaboration and collaboration is the name of the game in this one um, you want to help be the point of research for your community so you can uh, share out create collectives with open lines of, of conversation you want to understand what you need and what you bring to the table so that you can again like make sure you're having that appropriate equity exchange um, and then lastly what i want to leave everyone with is uh, the idea of aspirational versus inspirational marketing you want to think about what your audience wants uh, versus what they look like, what they do, or how much money they make. In cause marketing, it's really important to try to unlearn a lot of those marketing demographics that we've been bombarded with, you know, the, the traditional age, race, gender, income thinking, and change your thinking into, you know, what's the interest of my audience? What are their passions? What's the access? What maybe what's their personality like? Um, people are extremely smart and savvy and increasingly turned off by tone deaf advertising and at the end of the day i hear i hear a lot of people use the term most wrong and what i like to remind myself is most people are strangers <laughs> understand that you probably don't know your customer as well as you think you do and so the more that you can do do to engage with different organizations and engage with your customer and really really learn approach marketing from a learning place that is your point of engagement with your customer with your different organizations and the place where we can actually start to understand better what is really needed, not just what we believe is needed in our own personal lives or in our own personal mind. Um, so final slide I wanna leave you with is a wonderful quote from Philip Henderson, uh, who you may or may not know is part of the, is leading the Full Circle Everest expedition coming up this May, but he, this this quote that he said has always stuck with me where when it comes to this you want to rethink what what ROI stands for and what he states it as is recognize the opportunity for inspiration we all are participating in a capitalistic society we all need finances to survive but if we can all work together and start to elevate different sources of value beyond solely finances um, we will find ways to, to reorganize how we all work together and try to make this a more sustainable future, not only for our planet, but our, for us as individuals and for all of us working together. That's all I got. Back to you, Lexi. Great. Thanks so much, Danica. We're really grateful to have you on our board of directors at California Outdoor Recreation Partnership. All right, I'm up next. <laughs> I'm Lexi Gertelfeld. I'm the membership coordinator at California Outdoor Recreation Partnership. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm coming to you live from Pomodou Toyabi, which is Northern Paiute native lands um, in the Eastern Sierra of Mammoth Lakes, California, where I love to ski, rock climb, and trail run. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about why we care about 30 by 30 at California Outdoor Recreation Partnership. So first I'll give you a little background on CORP for those that are not familiar with our organization. This is why we exist. Um, we are home to the nation's largest outdoor industry economy in California. We contribute $44.5 billion in economic spending a year and a total of over 40, 488,000 jobs. 
The time has never been more important coming out of the pandemic to support active lifestyles, community health and wellness, and a shared love for California's outdoors. Um, at Corp, we educate legislators and the public about the role that our industry plays in improving economic opportunity, community health, and welcoming a diversity of outdoor enthusiasts across our great state. Our mission at Corp is to power a voice for the outdoor recreation industry to shape policy, support investments, and engage an inclusive community of outdoor participants in California around the benefits of outdoor recreation. Our makeup as an organization is that we are a coalition of 80 plus outdoor industry companies and organizations. Not all are based in California, but most um, have their highest economy in California due to our big user group base. Our agenda at Corp is that we advocate for increased and direct investment in outdoor recreation infrastructure, um, which includes projects and programs in support of um, stewardship and equal access to outdoor recreation for all Californians. Our priorities include pursuing and advocating for funding related to recreation infrastructure, supporting funding for conservation of California public lands, waters, and equitable access to them, and prioritizing supporting outdoor recreation, aka equitable access for all. Our background with 30 by 30 um, started in 2020, right before the pandemic. Uh, Assembly member Ash Kalra introduced AB 3030, which was California's introduction to 30 by 30. Um, unfortunately, with the pandemic that year, uh, the legislature decided not to pass any bills related, not related to COVID and the coronavirus itself. Um, so that bill died in the state Senate in August of 2020. Um, however, in October of that year, Governor Newsom introduced the executive order, which um, Jennifer talked about earlier, and we commended the governor on that. And then the following year, or the following session, Assemblymember Ash Collar introduced AB 30, which was a follow-up, um, which was a Human Right to Nature Act um, to 30 by 30, and we supported that bill because at the time we felt that the executive order did not address equitable access issues um, as much as we wanted them to be. Um, that bill did die this last year, um, but we feel like California Natural Resources Agency has done a great job at addressing equitable access, equitable access issues um, when it comes to 30 by 30 with the report that just came out. So why do we care about 30 by 30? Um, our number one priority with 30 by 30 at Corp is that there was a huge dedication to climate change resiliency. As we have seen, and I'm sure it's to no surprise to any attendees on this call, um, the world is undergoing a massive climate change and we believe it's man-made and we must do something about it and quick. Um, the other issues that arose with 30 by 30 that we want to address is that um, wildfire prevention was a huge part of it. Not a list that we wanna be ranked on, but California is sixth on the list of largest wildfires in the world after the 2020 fires. The August Complex fire in Glen Lake, Mendocino, Tahoma, Trinity, and Shasta County was over 1 million acres. And the Dixie Fire last summer was just under that at 963,000 acres. Fire season is year round now and our fires keep getting bigger every year. The other thing with 30 by 30 that it is that it protects biodiversity, which we think is important when it comes to conservation issues and preserving our natural work and working public lands. Um, we also support that 30 by 30 honors the sovereignty of tribal nations. We believe that's important at Corp and, and OA does as well. Um, and lastly, with 30 by 30, it enhances public access to recreation for all Californians and equitable access is huge for us. So with that, we are launching a social media campaign and we hope that your business will join us. Our hashtag is 30 by 30 now. We have created images and captions, um, which we will share at a link. Um, we have Twitter images. Let's say, if you care about this, you'll care about 30 by 30. 
We also have Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn images um, that are dedicated to user groups such as mountain bikers, climbers, skiers, surfers, and also generic outdoor user groups. We encourage your business to make their own images or you're welcome to use ours, but we would love for everyone to join in this hashtag 30 by 30 now. And with that, I'll turn it over to our board chairman, Matt Lyon. We'll go over a couple of things and then lead us into Q&A. All right, thank you so much, Lexi. <clears throat> Again, as Alexa mentioned, my name is Matt Lyon. I'm the chairperson of the California Outdoor Recreation Partnership. Um, also the CEO of Hydroback, a uh, recreation gear supplier based in Oakland, California. Um, I can speak personally uh, about 30 by 30 um, as just a member of our group. Um, when I got involved, we wanted to make sure that we were conversing um, with our administration, with our legislation about our industry's needs um, and our goals. And two of the big of the, uh, as Lexi has mentioned, two of the biggest have been around providing increased um, resources for outdoor recreation infrastructure. So we want to see continued investment uh, in expanding our outdoor areas and people's access to them uh, in California. Uh, and additionally, we want to see more people participating in our state in outdoor recreation. Uh, in a survey that came out recently in the last couple of years, California ranked the lowest out of the states in the West as far as the percentage of our population um, that participates regularly in outdoor recreation. Uh, it's kind of a surprise given how much we think of California as an outdoor oriented state. Um, but I think that just points to the challenge we have with our huge and diverse population. And so a big, uh, a big way to, for us to increase participation over time is to make sure that all of our community uh, has access and uh, is engaged uh, in outdoor recreation. So um, 30 by 30 has been a great opportunity, um, start, as, as uh, Lexi mentioned, for us to start the conversation with our legislatures, with our administration, um, to help shape it. Um, and to see that the goals really line, align with what we want to see um, moving forward in California. So this is a great cause for us to get behind. Um, going to kind of Danica's point, I believe it's a nonpartisan cause. Um, so there is not a, um, a right or a left necessarily on, on getting to some of these goals, um, depending on how you speak about it. So that's kind of a, a nice basis for us to move forward. Um, and we definitely will at Hydropack will be posting uh, from the social media campaign. Um, to help promote 30 by 30. Um, as listed on here, our social media campaign, californiaoutdoor.org, uh, which is our website for CORP, if you're looking uh, for what we are doing or information about CORP. And then if you go to there slash 30 by 30, you'll see the social media connections and the different uh, tools to be used. Um, also like to, before I jump into a Q&A here for our guests, um, put out a quick plug for membership in California Outdoor Recreation Partnership. It's important to be active, number one, and number two, we'd like you to be active by being a member. Um, it is not expensive, but it's a great way to help uh, get become united as an industry to represent one voice and a stronger voice uh, and to make sure that we're stronger together. As I said, um, when we speak with um, the, both our uh, administration and the legislation. So please consider it. Um, we're in, in particular looking to attract more specialty retailers um, from all different regions uh, of the state this year. And so we're going to be making outreaches to try to get out into the different regions and talking to specialty retailers directly and talk about how this is a great vehicle for folks who um, might not necessarily have that activity at the grass tops, um, as Alicia was referring to, um, with their local involvement, but is a good, good way to kind of connect our regional or local activities with the state level of activities, which do impact all of us. So uh, please consider it californiaoutdoor.org slash membership. Um, and so I do have some questions here. Um, love to, you know, first of all, thank you so much um, for our, our five speakers today. Um, great to hear the different perspectives. Um, 
and all focused on 30 by 30 and on corporate activism, which I think is, is uh, speaks to all the people on this call. Um, I'll, uh, I'll bring up a few questions. Um, first, can I uh, ask one of Danica, please? Um, you know, I think we, we're just talking about social media right now, Danica, um, about people posting on it. Um, I can tell you, I've you know, over the last couple of years, it's uh, social media is a great vehicle and sometimes a scary vehicle. Um, and I think you put it very well, talking about uh, make sure your equity exchange is in place um, before you um, promote uh, a cause or, or get out there and make sure your beliefs are in place. I wonder if you can give um, an example for us, maybe about uh, somewhere where you feel like it that is aligned. You know, because just to, I guess putting a little flesh behind this concept, uh, where you've seen the equitable exchange aligned with the message, maybe an example where it's not been aligned and it hasn't worked well for folks. And then just kind of a following on that with this 30 by 30 campaign that we'd like people to do, um, is there something people should be doing um, around that to make sure that they've got that exchange in place, if you will, or to make sure that we're addressing sensitivities before we go out into the marketplace? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. So I feel like one of the ways that it works really well is, um, you know, a, a number of brands engage with outreach organizations. And so I think if you're working with a nonprofit or an outreach organization who's really doing the work to increase participation and, and try to uh, increase and create equity within their region and their community, um, having that full relationship with them where you actually elevate them rather than, you know, having agreements that really promote your brand through them, but promote them through your brand. And, you know, it, it's going to depend on who has the larger platforms. You know, there, there's, there's a lot of individuals, organizations that have a way stronger platform than some brands, especially smaller brands. So, um, you know, what that looks like as far as who's, who's, really benefiting from it and making sure that you have those strong relationships and have developed conversation around what that looks like. Um, I think the challenge where it can go wrong is when there's not full alignment with what the organization is speaking to versus what their internal or traditional um, support looks like and so when you start to engage these conversations you you have to be ready to have that deeper level conversation too like you said social can be a really great place for this conversation but you're gonna have trolls you're gonna have people that want to challenge um what you're saying or what you're doing or why you're doing it and to me that is the healthy next step you know changing your marketing is is one level that we need to go to help with a lot of the conditioning that all of us have been subjected to um, visually and through media uh, for centuries. And so marketing is a good way to help kind of push that envelope and change what that looks like, but that is and should lead to conversation. <laughs> and so some of the conversation coming back to you may be challenging in the way that you have to deal with trolls or or collectivize efforts in order to reframe your messaging or learn a lesson. You know, maybe you found out that your messaging suffered from a little bit of greenwashing and you weren't actually as green as you thought, or you, or you project a little bit more diversity than you are actually helping to promote and participate. And so those conversations can be challenging and, and you gotta be ready for them. And, and I hope that people are, or hoping to match what they show in their marketing and try to take it to the next level. So walk the walk. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. To back up your talk, in other words, and and and, uh, and I can understand that. You know, it's, you know, from my perspective, we're always talking about uh, performance or competition and whatnot, and then immediately pivot and suddenly talking about social. Uh, justice that might seem quite strange um, if we haven't done any discussions beforehand and then and 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 can question why people you know question why we're doing that um and on the 30 by 30 do you think there's anything you know i know corp has been involved um quite a bit as, as lexi pointed out from the beginning of these discussions and and uh, has been active both with uh, uh on the state level legislatures is there anything else you know if someone wants to publish these 30 by 30 messages um, is association with corp enough is it uh, a message that you would expect people would get a lot of feedback on 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of those things that you want to make sure you have that relationship in place. So, you know, if you're a court member, we rely on the corp social postings a ton because that helps um, really drill into the messaging that corp has worked so hard to create in a bipartisan way. Um, I think there's a lot of resistance within um, team members, like within a brand or your customer base, that anything that you post political, people are going to read in one side or the other. There, it's it's a natural reaction, I think, right now that we're very polarized at this moment. So anything that you post politically may have a lens leaning into it. Um, but I do think that Corp has really done the work to to try to make the messaging very neutral. I think we need a lot more conversation going on that is it's okay to be political. It doesn't mean that it's partisan. And so I think that, that posting 30 by 30, for sure, there's a chance that you will have that challenge arise. Um, but to reach out to any of us at Corp and try to help with that conversation if it does arise and trying to keep redirecting the conversation to what we're actually talking about, which is just preserving planet and increasing livelihood. So that really shouldn't be a partisan conversation. And if it is, we got even bigger problems. <laughs> and, and you mentioned listening to the people for their feedback, which is important. Um, just curious, um, with the, I know that Cirrus is quite active in posting on these and, uh, mm -hmm. and you probably get some messages that you don't appreciate. Mm -hmm. um, has your choice been to respond or do you not? It's a mix. You know, if if someone is is clearly just looking to get some attention or try to, you know, start a fire where there is none, uh, a lot of times the, the best scenario is just to, you know, you go where you look, right? Just keep the focus on the things that are helping move things forward and um, let them get find another thing to attack or get get latched on to but a lot of times we do um, a lot of times we do respond to it any comment that we leave up um, we'll respond to it we rarely take comments down just because I think it's important to be able to display that it's possible to respond to mm -hmm. seemingly ridiculous comments and I think that there's a, a, grow, a growing collective where there's the majority of us that can recognize that's a troll. And then it's it's a little bit of a challenge to try to, you know, communicate back in a way that can actually redirect the conversation or or um, help the, help anyone else that sees that comment know how to appropriately respond to it. So yeah. we try to practice that. There's no way we're per perfect at it, but we try to practice so we can get better. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. No, I think you guys do a great job. So oh, thanks. Thank um, Question um, for Rebecca, um, talking a lot about um, what the federal government is doing with 30 by 30. It's interesting to me that there's this parallel process going on, um, the same initiative at the federal and at the state level. Um, how, I'm wondering if you can tell from what you've seen, how dependent is the national initiative um, based upon what the states do? Um, I'm thinking there's probably some states that are going to be more progressive. I think California is taking this very seriously and moving quickly on it. I'd imagine there's other states that aren't. Um, I'm, do you have any feel for how many states are taking this up, as uh, Dr. Norris mentioned, on kind of a subnational level, um, or how dependent our, our, our federal government's actions are going to be based upon how states respond to this? Thank you for that question, Matt. And you know, I I don't mean to be I don't often have a flair for the dramatic, but it's going to be completely reliant on local and state action. Um, yes, we're going to have all of these hopefully awesome opportunities to designate more public lands. And when I talk public lands, I'm not just talking sort of landscape scale public lands, but also your local park and um, you know other sort of uh, green infrastructure throughout uh, urban or suburban areas. But of course, when we think about the federal government, we do tend to opt to think about the Antiquities Act and, and these big, big public land designations. So that will still be happening. And uh, again, the Biden administration wants to hear from the industry and from stakeholders who um, have have voices to sort of talk about where these, these um, monument designation should be. But when it comes to the actual work on the ground, um, the Biden administration has really made it clear that 
that locally led portion of America the Beautiful is the guiding factor. Um, so when I think about what kind of states are taking action, you know, we're seeing a lot of activity in, in the West, California, New Mexico, Nevada. We're seeing, if we're not seeing interest at the executive level in the governor's office, for example, we'll see a little bit of interest at the agency level, like at a Department of Natural Resources like CNRA, or we're seeing interest from a, a state legislator who is is sort of interested in environmental issues or outdoor recreation or the outdoor economy. And so what we're trying to do at OIA and with our sort of uh, allies and, and stakeholders that we work with often is to make sure that any of those interested party, whether they be a public sector employee or a state-based legislator, um, could come to us and get more information about America the Beautiful what it means and and how to move forward. Um, but I would say, you know, we're seeing probably resolutions at the state level from, uh, you know, joint resolutions of legislatures in maybe 10 or 15 states this year, um, which is good, but it's not enough. So uh, I think Danica talking about, uh, I think she said sort of depoliticizing the language just because it's political, it's not partisan. Um, I think that kind of language and that tact is really important for making sure it moves at, at the local level. Hmm. Okay. Well then good. We're 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 focused on the right area then in California and trying to make things sure things are moving forward. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, Dr. Norris, I've got a couple questions for you here. Um, first one um, Curious, you mentioned we're at 24% for lands and 16% for waterways, um, and we've got eight years to get to 30%. You identified a number of different pathways we could get there. Um, just how hard do you think this is going to be? I mean, is, do we have a, a lot of this which is fairly close to push over the edge um, to get identified as 30 by 30? Or are we quite a ways away as far as, because I mean, 6% of the state is still a big piece of the state. Um, so, and I, so I'm wondering, you know, how, just how difficult do you think it's going to be for us to achieve this? And what do you think are going to be the, the most uh, productive pathways of the ones that you mentioned? I think it's totally doable. Obviously it requires, you know, collective purpose and an investment above and beyond where we are today. We've got a good start, but we've got to keep that momentum going. I think if we had <clears throat> investments on the scale of what we're doing now, um, not every year over the next eight years, but over many of the years, I think we could absolutely achieve it. And I, you know, which is the most effective, you know, I want to echo what was just said about the sort of locally driven conservation. There you know, really investing in that regional look at where the priorities are and helping those regional and local entities implement their own conservation planning, I think is the most effective path, which then hits on all the others, whether, the, you know, whether it's most appropriate in that place to work together to put a new state park together, or it's more effective to um, implement local conservation easements or acquire new, you know, land trust properties. It really varies across the state. You know, we spent a lot of time in the last year gathering input from people all over the state. We did regional workshops asking, you know, what works in your community? And the answers were all over the place, which is heartening. It means we have a lot of opportunity to sort of drive in a lot of directions at once. So we need this network of motivated people to help us um, help us push for funding, push for support, but also do the work. Uh, so I'm excited about this larger conversation and, and bringing people to the table. I'll share with you that this outreach uh, effort that we did, over 4,000 individual people sat through two or three hours of webinars on 30 by 30 over the course of the year. I think that's a really good group of people to tap into in addition to the, the membership that you all bring. I mean, I think there's a lot of hunger and excitement out there and people just wanna know how they can plug in and help. And I think there are opportunities everywhere for that. So um, I think it's absolutely doable. We just have to get to work. Okay, well, that's, that's a great um, outreach and listening uh, effort that you guys led. And I'll tell you, I sat through one of those webinars and I think- uh, <laughs> Sorry. 
and well, it's, it's, this is how it has to be done. Uh, yeah. Again. Yeah. We should have been in person, but yeah. I'm glad that the listening went on. Um, you identified, I didn't add the, the numbers up, but somewhere between a billion and $2 billion um, mm -hmm. directed towards this effort. Um, are those newly appropriated funds for this, or, or is that kind of a summary of the, the money that we've already been spending around these areas? So that's last year's budget uh, act. So, you know, there was a surplus and we, you know, doubled down on conservation all over the resources agency. So invested in wildfire, invested in water resilience, climate change. Um, and then these are the, the actions that I pulled out of our budget that directly help us achieve 30 by 30. So that was last year's budget act. Um, we're hoping f there's opportunity for more moving forward, you know, in the next in the next cycles as well. So that 758 million uh, nature-based solutions, that was a set aside. We're gonna uh, present sort of the breakdown of what pots of money we're gonna, how we're gonna distribute that money in coming months. Um, mm -hmm. So that's sort of last year's money that'll be over the next two years. But that's all money that's sort of in play right now. Okay. Yeah, that was a fantastic budget allocation. We were very happy to see that. Yeah, and, uh, so are we. <laughs> the Secretary Barranco shared that with us and we were just, yeah. <laughs> like, because I've yeah. been funding for uh, for these kind of infrastructure, in, you know, we call it outdoor recreation infrastructure as well as the, you know, what you, uh, the conservation and the biodiversity efforts. Um, you mentioned, you know, two of the, of the key pieces, one being access to nature, mm -hmm. uh, and another being um, kind of achieving diversity and inclusion, um, those streak, uh, speak very strongly to causes that, that we support and that our, that our members care about. Um, can you talk about how this kind of spending, um, in addition to biodiversity, is going to result in more access for, um, out, for outdoor recreation, I guess for hikers and bikers and runners and the things that we like to do? So I should tell you that my work is part of sort of multiple pieces of uh, the Nature-Based Solutions Executive Order. There were actually sort of eight subsections. 30 by 30 was one. It gets a lot of the attention, I think, because it's so catchy and it kind of touches on all the others. Um, right. But we're super focused on the sort of getting, getting places from one column A to column B, right? They're not in a protected state now. How do we get them in a protected state in the future? So what are the mechanisms to make that happen? A lot of the what happens on that landscape is interrelated with that, um, but not directly tied to sort of the first first task, right? Which is getting it done. But I will tell you the key to the outdoor access piece is that we also late last year launched our um, Outdoors for All initiative at the state level with new funding for uh, acquisitions and programming and um, you know, providing people access through, you know, reduced user fees and so on. And there's going to be a listening tour. I'm pretty sure this is how it's going to roll out. Very similar to how we did 30 by 30. There'll be um, engagement that will result in a roadmap for how we can achieve equitable access to nature. And we have a new deputy secretary for access, Catherine Toy, and she's leading that effort. So that's just getting launched. So all that really important programming stuff is, is to come. And I hope that you all stay engaged because you'll be a really important part of that conversation, how to do that right in a way that protects natural spaces and gives people access to them. So that's interesting. I mean, it's something that we saw in the past, the um, money for conservation didn't always necessarily mean money for um, access, human right. access and recreation. And right. it was one of our, our um, principles was to try to be a proponent for outdoor recreation hand in hand with that conservation and that they can go together and that the more that we get people engaged in the outdoor in a responsible way, the more people will care. Um, totally so, agree. Yeah. And so is this, um, you said, so getting things across the, the line. To, <laughs> That's a simplistic way to put it, but yeah, sure. To some and degree. You, you made yeah. a great point to start. It's like, we have to count this somehow. How do we count yeah. it? I can imagine you're quite focused on how can we get things across. Um, and now Outdoors for All, do you think that these, um, you know, how, the, the use for the land, um, is that going to get designated at the time that it gets moved across? Or is that something? Oh, that yeah. Happen? I mean, that's part of the definition, right? So it's it's not as simple as, you know, one column to the other, but really it's 
identifying places that have high biodiversity that we need to protect, you know, making sure that there's a management and stewardship plan in place to protect those. So that's part of our definition. Um, okay. And then sort of what are the legal structures that protect it? You know, that's all those pieces go together. Um, mm -hmm. but, but as to your point, you know, there's, an, there's a whole other set of things that have to be taken into consideration, which is how do you make sure you have money for stewardship and monitoring and tracking how well these, these places are performing according to plan or not? And how mm -hmm. do you ensure that we're managing lands to address climate change effectively? Like all these little pieces have sort of uh, tangential uh, efforts in our agency and they're all interconnected at 30 by 30. So they're all happening. They're just not all articulated in our strategy right now. Well, I think we've all realized over the last couple of years when wildfires are raging out of control, people don't recreate, right? People, are, <laughs> people, hide, people do not come to this state. Um, right. Right. And um, climate change affects our bottom line as much as anything, um, that, that we have to think about all of these things when we move forward. And so yeah. you know, biodiversity, the climate impact, as well as kind of getting our full populations out. Um, I've got a few um, uh, call, uh, questions that came in for you um, from oh. some of our listeners. Um, first one, um, does organically farmed land count as preserved land? And will there be government subsidies for certified organic farmers? That is a great question. So I said that the Nature Based Solutions Executive Order has eight pieces. And advancing things like organic agriculture and sustainable agriculture is absolutely one of the key pieces. The question, it's hard to answer whether an organic farm counts. It depends a lot on what are the actual practices and how durable are those. So um, on the one hand, we want to advance that and we'll be supporting those efforts and the Department of Food and Ag is working really hard on, on working on soil health, you know, and organic farming in general, um, regenerative farming whether it counts for 30 by 30 is sort of a, a more nuanced question and depends on the, the piece of land we're talking about. So maybe is the answer, <laughs> but it's an important part of the puzzle regardless. No, well, that's fair. That's fair. Um, okay. A second question. Um, will the content and data from California nature GIS be part of the federal government's concept for a conservation atlas? Ah, that is a very wonky question. I wonder who asked that. Um, so, in fact, the data that uh, inform our California nature talk to the federal data sets. So we use a similar uh, data collection platform and we feed information into the national data system. So um, our protected area database talks to their protected area database. They're not exactly the same, but they're close enough for purposes of the webinar. Whoever's asking the question, you can call me, we can talk about it more. But, um, and then we've got within ours, you know, our California-based information about biodiversity and climate projections and where we have access to nature. So that's more California-focused. And I don't actually know what their plans are at the moment about whether they're, they're going to roll up all 50 states into some Uber system. I, I think they're still figuring all that out. Hmm. But we're in conversation well, with them about, you know, what we've got and what we can offer. I'd love to see all 50 states providing data. That's uh, that'd be great. <laughs> I agree. How much we're leading or lagging in California, but I, I tend to think we're leading on these things. Yeah, I mean, California invested a lot in these data sets, and not most states don't have them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, this one might be a little tougher. How do you respond to those who oppose land and water restrict protections um, that could restrict public use? So we're, if we're prioritizing biodiversity over public use, um, and, and this uh, listener in particular was thinking about marine areas, so marine protected areas. How do I respond? I mean, I guess I wanna believe that there is enough out there for us to meet all of our needs. And if we do it responsibly and strategically, that's a bit of a punt, but I think we've been really effective in California at finding ways to make those things work at the statewide level. But each of those sort of local conversations about what we're gonna do in this place, those are still challenging. Like this doesn't fix that, right? It just says we wanna find a way to 
push that conversation along, find resolution if we can. Um, so, you know, to me, protecting biodiversity, it's not a nice to have, it's a have to have. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't, our planet doesn't function without the plants and animals that are on this planet. Like we are reliant on them. And I know we don't think about that all the time, but as a, as an ecologist, I can't unsee that. And so for me, it's, Figuring out how to how to do it in a way that doesn't unduly harm a particular group or make sure that we've addressed sort of what some of those um, conflicts are as best we can. But also we have to find a way to protect our biodiversity if we want to keep this planet healthy. Yeah, we saw that while we were lobbying for the initial 3030, AB 3030 30 bill, that one of the loudest voices coming out was from commercial fishermen and mm -hmm. from private fisher, fishermen and guides um, who were concerned about losing access to fishing waters. And yeah. it was, again, it's hard to address without being specific. Um, yeah, and I, I think the MPA process was challenging for a lot of people. I wasn't here for it. I know it was contentious, which is partly why California is sort of taking MPAs off the table in the short term. You know, we're not focused on excluding fishing as sort of the key uh, pathway. There's lots of other important things. You know, we came out with our microplastics plan just last week. Like that's a huge problem for ocean protection. That's got nothing to do with fishing, but the amount of plastic we're dumping into the ocean is really, it, it's killing those ecosystems and we've got to do something about that. So pollution, offshore drilling, those are other issues that we can talk about. Um, and, and I think we will be moving forward. Okay, great. Well, we're just about out of, out of time here, so I'm going to have to wrap up, but let me, um, First of all, thank you, Dr. Norris, for participating today, for um, your attitudes in, in the administration, for both listening to us and working with us, and for moving 30 by 30 forward. And thank you to Governor Newsom um, for his support on this issue. Um, we were certainly super excited when he made that part of his, his mandate um, for us moving forward. So thank you very much for being here today. I'd also thank like you. to thank Rebecca Gillis um, with OIA. Great to hear from her. Um, Alicia Harvey from REI. Uh, unfortunately, she had to run. I'd love to follow up with her more on that America the Beautiful um, that uh, outreach mechanism that they put together and see if we can get one for California. Uh, we could definitely use that. We're, we're a big enough place. We've got 40 million people. And thank you to Danica Carey with Cirrus. Um, hopefully those questions weren't too hard. Uh, and to Lexi Grittelfeld um, um, with Corp. Um, for your explanation around what we're doing with CORP and for setting this up for us. Um, and for all CORP members, thank you very much for your support. Um, thank you very much for listening today. It's through activity that we get our voices heard and ultimately can play a part in where our state goes. So thank you for attending today and look forward to uh, interacting with everyone again soon. Bye-bye.